What up guys, Shredded Otaku here. Uh, it's been a little bit since my last video, uh, apologies for that, and I'll, I'll kind of explain why uh, towards the end. But today I want to talk about a, a game series that has all of a sudden become relevant again, and it's possibly my favorite game series of all time, if not my number one favorite, and that would be The Legend of Zelda. I want to talk today about just like where I started with The Legend of Zelda series, why it's so important to me, uh, why it, I feel like it honestly made me into a gamer and then kind of go over just like the whole series as a whole uh, some of my favorite parts of it maybe circle back at the end talk a little bit about what we do know in regards to the new Zelda game Tears of the Kingdom and then also kind of segue into some topics regarding the latest Nintendo Direct that's been a few weeks but still a topic of conversation guys really quick Every YouTuber has to say this, but if you enjoy content like this, if you're new here and you just like the artful juxtaposition of a short buff tattooed guy gushing over video games and figurines, feel free to drop a like, subscribe. I'd love to have you here. Anyway guys, let's get right into it. Um, so again, <laughs> today we're talking about The Legend of Zelda and I gotta start with, you know, this is a super cliche vanilla favorite Zelda game, but I gotta start with the basics. I gotta start where it all began for me and a lot of other 90s gamers. And that is with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now, this game for me was just like, it was so, uh, no pun intended, legendary. Um, I remember going over to one of my best friend's house as a kid and his older brother, I think I was like three years old at the time. And it's funny, I wanna say his brother was like eight. And to me, he was like a cool, you know, old brother. <laughs> you know, I remember back to those little nostalgic memories you had as a kid. And he was playing Ocarina of Time. And I remember thinking in my head as a kid how of how much of like a more mature experience that looked in contrast to like what I was used to, which was just like the side scroll Super Mario games that um, I had been playing. Uh, back in the 90s, 1998 was when this game was released. And anything open world, anything that had that level of exploration was just absolutely mind blowing. I mean, it, it had never been done. So even though like, you know, if you were to go back and play this game now, which if you haven't played this game, you still should. Uh, it seems very just bare bones basic in terms of like a sandbox game. You have to remember that back in 1998, that was a big deal to have all of that just kind of there for you to explore. Uh, I mean, not only that, but just the entire story. Um, for me, the Legend of Zelda series has always kind of been like a coming of age story, almost like the same, for the same reasons I like shonen manga. It really just, helps alleviate a lot of the stresses you have. As a, as a young kid growing up, um, I feel like it's a really good kind of trial and error process that teaches you what it means to be a strong entity. Uh, and that sounds super weird, but there's a lot of like really deep metaphors if you look into Ocarina of Time. Uh, you grow up as a kid that all you know from the start is that everyone else in your little town, village, has a fairy and you don't. They're all children. That all makes sense later on. Um, and what you come to find very early in the game, this isn't really a spoiler, but you're not like these kids at all. So you're getting picked on because you don't have a fairy. Um, you're just this kind of outcast, which again, like for a lot of young kids, like those feelings of anxiety and wanting to fit in, like it hits home and you don't as a kid understand why, but you find out very early on that you're meant for more. And the entire story is basically, I mean, it's the Legend of Zelda, there's a whole le legend outside of that, but the story for Link is like just him finding himself. And that to me was always just so powerful, even though I didn't realize why as a kid growing up, but it really did stick with me. Um, long gush about that one there. Directly after that game, we had the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which arguably to me might be my favorite. Um, I don't think it would be my favorite if not for my prior experience with Ocarina of Time. So it's not really like a fair judgment, but I feel like this game is neglected and not looked at um, in the same light for reasons that, you know, are fair and valid. Um, there's only four temples. It's not the same level of scope. Um, and there's a lot of repetitive actions that you have to do in this game. But what I think is so interesting is, uh, so Ocarina of Time was released in 1998, huge success. Uh, back in the nineties and even today in the Japanese game and and also the anime industry. Uh, a lot of times when there's rapid success in something like that, uh, directors are kind of urged to have a deadline for the next installment that is super unfair, but they want those capital uh, capitalizations to take place. They want their next sale, so um, they're usually under contract. 
Anyway, this guy, uh, the team that developed Ocarina of Time, was forced then to create the next Zelda game in about a year and a half, which is crazy. They, they, they took like, I want to say like six years for Ocarina of Time, and it was a huge trial and error process. And then immediately, right after that, they were like, dude, less than a year and a half, we need this next Zelda game. We need it out. It is the year 2000 when this game was on the market, on the shelves here in North America. So they had a very short deadline. Um, and if you look at, you know, if you were to look back at some of the interviews, which I did, um, this game was actually developed with a lot of, I mean, obviously there's a lot of tension, a lot of stress, and that bled out into the development of the game and the art style, the direction, um, the entire opening cinematic where Link is literally having a nightmare and being chased by creatures that he has then transformed into. Uh, is based off of a nightmare that the, dire the director had um, when he was just swamped with work uh, doing concept art of these characters. He literally had a nightmare about these things chasing him. So um, it's, it's very dark, and it's, the tone of the game is, is that way throughout uh, the entire thing. It's, it's a very creepy tale, and I think it just stands out to this day in the Zelda series for that reason. Uh, I don't know if it was intentional. I don't know if Nintendo looked at it at the end and was like, okay, but... Um, I think it works, and I think it's really cool. I think it's super interesting to go back to. Despite its like uh, technical limitations, it will always kind of be immortalized for that reason. Um, so those will always, to me, be the crown jewels of the Zelda series. Obviously, you can't really replace nostalgia. But objectively speaking, I feel like the series only gets better. Um, a little bit later on in the years, we had the GameCube come out, right? And everybody was excited for the realistic looking Zelda game that we imagined uh, because the GameCube was touted as being this ultra powerful console. And a lot of people don't know this, but the GameCube was actually more powerful than the PlayStation 2 at the time. It was the most powerful console on the market last time Nintendo ever uh, went that route with their technology. But um, we were given a tech demo back at uh, Space World in, I wanna say like 2002. Um, don't quote me on that date. But we were shown a very realistic battle uh, scene of Link and Ganon. And everybody right away was like, yo, like we are this close to that realistic Zelda game that we've been dreaming of. Like, oh my God, this is it. Then uh, Nintendo dropped the ball and said, here's the next Zelda game a couple years later. And people were shocked at what they saw. Um, the art style for The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker was very, very kiddie. Uh, I, you know, Toon Link, which I'm sure if you're watching this and you know what Zelda is, you're familiar with Toon Link, but when Toon Link was introduced, uh, there was a lot of negative feedback. And, and to this day, a lot of people hate on uh, Wind Waker because it was like, to them, it was like a lazy kind of like, okay, like we don't feel like it. We're going to make this kitty thing. It's going to be easier. From my perspective as a kid, I was a little shocked, but I never remember being uh, doubting them. I, I looked at it and it looked to me, it looked extremely stylized and artistic. And that's how it played out for me when I ended up picking up the game, was um, you just this bubbly world that was so kind of, a, kind of like a blank slate for these characters to portray themselves in every possible way. Like there's parts of Wind Waker that are super dark and emotional. And there's also a ton of parts, obviously, with the bubbly art style that are very just kind of giddy and, and just fun, like pure fun. But I think that, uh, again, just like in the same sense as Majora's Mask is unique and immortalized for it being so different in terms of its themes, I think the Wind Waker is the same way in the sense where like, they're never gonna go that art direction again and just have these expressive, shitty characters. Uh, and I really think that it's, it's, it's cool for that reason. You know, it didn't need to be that. Obviously the technology, the hardware at the time allowed for so much more, but they chose to go the route of having like a stylized artistic direction. And I really respect that. And um, I just think that Wind Waker is, a, is an amazing title. Um, <clears throat> going forward, I can't spend too much time on any one game, but um, going forward in the same generation, we also got uh, Four Swords Adventures, which is a Zelda game that a lot of people have not heard of, but it was like the first take on a multiplayer Zelda. They've done a ton of iterations since. Um, they've also done most recently, oh gosh, so many games here. And that's the one I did not pull out. But uh, most, rec <laughs> most recently, there, it was Triforce Heroes for the 3DS. Um, was the last time they, they attempted to do a take on the multiplayer Zelda. 
and actually I have to retract myself because the first, the very first time they did this was actually um, an add-on uh, content for uh, the Game Boy Advance remake of A Link to the Past, where if you linked up four of those together, you were able to play The Legend of Zelda Four Swords. And it was super hard to do because you had to have four people that had A Link to the Past and also had a Game Boy Advance and also had a Link Cable. Um, I remember I played it once because I, at school, we finally got enough people together to do that. Um, but it lasted like an hour and a half. And we were like, that was cool. Never had that opportunity again. Um, a few years later, I want to say this was like 2006, uh, we got Four Swords Adventures, which was like the fleshed out version of that little trial uh, experience they put out. And this game was uh, not really adored at the time, but man, it is cool. It, it was like, um, me and my brothers ended up saving up our money to get all these different peripherals that we needed, because you needed you needed a, like three Game Boys, three GameCube adapters that linked up to these Game Boys, as well as um, obviously a, a GameCube controller for the first player. It was like this whole weird setup you had to do. It was a lot of extra cords and cost a lot of money, but we put all our money together so that we could play a Zelda game together. And it was a really crazy cool experience. Um, just like the other two games that I just mentioned are kind of immortalized for being unique. This is, to me, immortalized in the sense where it's like the only, to this day, the only really good multiplayer Zelda experience I think that there is and probably ever will be. Um, it's a very expensive game to try to find now, um, especially if you want to get authentic versions of all those cables and stuff, but super dope. Um, I really hope that we get back to that at some point. Um, we probably never will. Uh, from there, guys, we, uh, we transitioned into the Wii era, which again, we were all kind of like, what is this next Zelda game going to be? Is it going to be realistic? Is it not? And they finally came through and gave us The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Uh, it was originally released on the GameCube and ported as a launch title for the uh, Nintendo Wii. And the Nintendo Wii version was literally just the GameCube version with a flipped map because they had to make Link right-handed. So they just, they just flipped the entire, like, everything um, to, to make that work. And they put some really tacked on motion controls that were awful. This is honestly like the worst version of this game ever made. Um, but it's the one that I played. It's the one that me and my brothers played as kids. So it's the one that I hold on to. Um, and I think it's fine just because I have nostalgic memories of it. Um, ironically enough, I, this is my least favorite Zelda game. And a lot of people think that's odd, you know? But um, I think for me, I was just at like, I was in my angsty teen years during Twilight Princess. so. Even though it's like everything I wanted in a Zelda game, it just didn't hit the same way as these uh, these other titles did, you know? And every teenager has their own experiences. And for me, video games just weren't so big at the time. Um, I do kind of want to go back to this as an adult. Uh, I was really hoping they would remake HD versions of this for the Switch. Um, I have the HD versions for the Wii U of uh, Wind Waker and Twilight that I haven't played yet. So I guess I'll go back and play those at some point now. Super great game, objectively speaking, probably one of, if not the best uh, 3D Zelda game ever made. Just didn't hit the same way for me, and I know that's super weird. Um, from there, it's a long list, got a lot to go over. I'm running out of breath almost, but um, from there, we go forward into the end of the Wii era. And um, we get, and I remember thinking when playing Twilight Princess, like, even before I really understood like game development and stuff, I was again a teenager, but I remember playing it and thinking like, but what if there was a Zelda game where it was actually just made for the Wii? Like I wonder what that would feel like if they really took advantage of these motion controls. Um, in a 2011, they finally did that. With The Legend of Zelda, I did not bring, oh I did. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, which you might know as The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD if you're newer to the game scene because they did just remake this last year for the Nintendo Switch. But this was a game that was, it was almost funny to me how they kind of like stuck the, the art style for Wind Waker and Twilight Princess in a blender almost, and just kind of created this like semi-realistic watercolor style, which I think is super cool. Um, admittedly on the Wii, you really couldn't appreciate it because it looked like everything was just smeared with Vaseline and super over pixelated. So again, it was kind of a disappointing time for me, once again, um, going and trying to enjoy it right after I had started playing uh, things in the 360. At the time, Skyrim was also very popular. So I remember going back and forth between Skyrim, which was 
kind of a groundbreaking experience similar to what I felt with uh, Ocarina at time as a kid. And that thing was like HD, it was when HDMI cords were kind of being uh, introduced as more of like streamlined and uh, just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Standardized. So everything was becoming HD, 1080, 720p, and then you try to go back, or I try to go back and play this 480i Wii game on my brand new giant plasma screen. I just wasn't having it. Like, I beat the game, I enjoyed the gameplay, but it didn't hit me the same way, just for that reason. Um, last year when I replayed it on the Switch, uh, this version here, I was able to kind of appreciate it a lot better. Um, still not my favorite Zelda game, basically just because it's so linear. Um, Storytelling wise, amazing title. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Woo, almost out of breath. Uh, lots of Zelda stuff. In between those, we've obviously got tons of remakes and handheld titles. Two handheld titles that aren't talked about a lot that I've actually managed to hold on, hold on to over the years are the sequels to The Wind Waker that I loved and adored very much. And that's Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. A lot of times when people look at these games and they're like in a retrospective talking about uh, the Zelda series as a whole, these are the two that they kind of hate on. And I don't really understand why, um, other than the fact that they have those tacked on touch controls, because this, the puzzles and the music and everything are pretty incredible. Um, highly recommend checking these out. Uh, sprinkled in throughout all of those, we had a ton of Game Boy titles, Game Boy Advance, um, 3DS, 3DS remakes, which are uh, just absolutely amazing. Uh, the two best games in the series, in my opinion, were remade on the Nintendo 3DS and to what I believe to be, to this day, the definitive versions of these games. These games were completely redone with cutting edge graphics, which on the 3DS didn't say a whole lot, but I mean, they look like GameCube games with 3D graphics. Um, these are really just amazing. Like if you have, if you've never played Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask, these are the ways to play them. Like absolutely. Um, this is actually a copy that my little brother bought for me back in 2015. Um, and I loved it so much that I, <laughs> I went uh, and bought this special edition figure from the UK. I paid like way too much money for this, but I freaking love these games and I was so excited that they, uh, they remade them. We also got a sequel to the, uh, which I left out in my video, but uh, in my storytelling. Uh, but they, we also got a sequel to A Link to the Past, which was the third installment in the Legend of Zelda series. I guess I started my timeline from when I, I began personally, but um, hang on one sec. Let me grab something off the shelf. The very original Zelda games <laughs> were uh, obviously The Legend of Zelda and Zelda II. Um, these two I did play on the NES just for like, kind of like a uh, retro experiment as I grew older. I, I'm not old enough to have played these games as a kid, but they're super great experiences for their time, technological masterpieces. Uh, just as an added bonus, one cool thing that I found at a comic book shop was this high score card that was, I think this was like 1987. It says on the back here that this was uh, 1988. But yeah, back in the days when uh, everything was like plastic and analog, you would actually like take this out of the box and write your high score on these different little trophies that they had for the NES, which apparently no one ever did. I don't know if this thing's worth money or not, but it's pretty sweet. Um, so yeah, we uh, technically the Zelda series started with Zelda 1 and Zelda 2, The Adventure Link. Um, and Zelda 1 was the open world top-down version that we're all probably familiar with, we've seen. But not a lot of people have seen much of Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because it plays like a super hard fusion of freaking Final Fantasy and a Castlevania game, which is crazy and unique, but not very fun and accessible. Um, <laughs> I did play this game, admittedly, I think I was like 19, and I just was on a whim to beat a game that is frustratingly difficult. Um, and I ended up kind of like over grinding. I, I stayed up for like days on end, just grinding these little slimes, trying to get to a level where I could actually beat the temples. Still never beat the game. Stupid hard game. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the titles that I left out of my personal experience were Zelda 1, 2, and then A Link to the Past, which was released in 1992. And for a lot of people is the crown jewel of the entire series. For me personally, I just was being born at that time. So it obviously didn't hit me that way. 
Okay, a lot to go over. Um, and uh, that kind of felt like a rant towards the end, but I really just wanted to go over just like the entirety of my experience with the series because I really feel like it lends itself to just how much of a mega fan I am. Um, <laughs> outside of that, you know, I've grown fo so fond of this series over the years. Uh, my very first tattoo, which is crazy. I was, uh, I was 17 years old and I got a Triforce tattooed on my, <laughs> on my left hand. If you're familiar with the series, you know why I did that. Um, and this has been redone multiple times. It did not look this good when I was 16. Uh, I had a newer artist kind of do the gold around it recently, for example. But um, the story of the hero kind of presents itself in the same way in most of the Zelda games. And when they finally, when Link finally figures out who he is, um, usually the emblem kind of presents itself on his hand. And uh, so, you know, I was 17. Um, I was in a different place in my life. I thought it was a cool tattoo idea. In retrospect, I probably should have gotten it on my shoulder, but it's been a really cool conversation starter uh, ever since. So yeah, obviously I love this series a lot. It's very near and dear to me. Um, it's kind of been there throughout the entirety of my gaming uh, career, if you will. <laughs> and now, let's uh, segue into the next step of this conversation. Now we're starting to see news about the next Legend of Zelda game. And uh, I guess before we talk about the next Legend of Zelda game, we have to talk about the one kind of elephant in the room game that I left out, which would be the last installment in the Zelda series, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which to most modern gamers, I think, is their Ocarina of Time. Um, this game here, released in 2017 for the Nintendo Switch, and it shook the gaming world in the same way that Ocarina of Time did back in 1998. And to me, that is just so beautiful. Um, you know, I remember my first experience with that game was uh, seeing a seeing a roommate of mine have a Nintendo Switch and playing it, uh, borrowing it, just kind of running around and having that same feeling of awe and also being old enough to think to myself, man, if only I had this when I was a kid, right? <laughs> um, my little brother, it was his first Zelda game. And I know that that was kind of the experience he had, which was very similar to what I had, uh, you know, with Ocarina of Time growing up. It's that groundbreaking, <clears throat> just everything is out there, everything is accessible, and you just, you just gotta kind of point and choose at that point, right? Um, it, it's, it's such an organic zen experience to explore that world. And if you haven't done that, you gotta give it a try. Uh, it, was the most, it was the most impactful game, I think, of the last generation, and still stands as a work of art and testament to what Nintendo and what the Zelda team is capable of. Um, just absolute masterpiece. Uh, I had to, you know, I, I bought the original copy and I love the game so much that I went back and I bought a special edition recently uh, just because it's just such a work of art um, but now the year is 2022 back in 2019 we got our first JPEG image of the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2 or I think it said like sequel to the Breath of the Wild is in development back in like 2019 so we've known this has been coming for years and everybody has been on the edge of their seats wondering and now we're finally starting to hear news about the next Zelda game, which is called, not Breath of the Wild 2. <laughs> it's called Tears of the Kingdom. And it's so funny to me how they held back that title. Um, I remember their excuse at the time was that it was going to allude to some of the plots. Uh, it was gonna be almost like a spoiler to know the name of the game. I, you know, now we know the name of the game and I don't think it has any kind of insight to what's gonna happen, but um, you know, for whatever reason, probably just for the impactfulness of what it was gonna be when they did drop the title. Now we know the title of the game. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, you know, I, to kind of segue also and, and dive into why I didn't talk too much about the Nintendo Direct other than like that little short I did, um, I felt really bad after doing my video of like the predictions for the Nintendo Direct. And I, I step back and I look at everything that I was doing and what I want to create on this channel um, as a content creator going forward. And I realized that I was really just kind of doing what everyone else was doing, which was following the trends, trying to get clicks. And, uh, you know, everybody did think that the Nintendo Direct was gonna go into a certain direction. Um, we thought there was gonna be a lot of remakes of Zelda games, some possible GameCube game, other GameCube game titles uh, announced, and, and they just weren't. 
whatever reason that is, who knows? Were those games in existence? I don't, I don't know. So if the camera shifted a little bit, uh, girlfriend stopped by, we had some dinner together. But to continue with what I was saying, um, were those games in development? Are they coming? Uh, you know, nobody knows at this point. Uh, patents were, were issued. Um, all these leaks were, were supposedly found. Um, but as far as what this means for us, it's like, I just wanna say that going forward, I think that I will stay away from rumors, things like that, and simply focus on more of a creative conversation starter type channel. And uh, to get back to like, you know, the collector side of things. Um, if you follow the channel already and kind of see where that might lead, um, I just wanted to throw that out there, you know? Um, so today, what I really wanted to get into, uh, and this has been such a drawn out video, if you're still here, congratulations, and I appreciate you. But with Breath of the Wild 2, AKA, or, you know, authentically speaking, with the new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom, like, what do we want to see? Like, let's start the conversation of what should this Zelda game be? Because we know what Breath of the Wild was, obviously, right? Like, it was this open world kind of blank slate, almost like a Skyrim game um, for Zelda, right? Like, it was completely open world, go wherever you want. Um, I guess a better comparison would be, it's like, if you were to go back to the original NES Legend of Zelda game, um, it was basically that, but modernized, right? Like, you can pick and choose where you go. The only limitations are like, you know, there's gonna be certain points where if you try to pull out the Master Sword without a certain amount of hearts, you'll die. Um, sorry if that's a spoiler for someone, but it shouldn't be. Um, but what I would like to see, some of the things that I feel like as great as Breath of the Wild was, like there were some things that I feel like were left out and I would love to see them in Tears of the Kingdom. Um, and everybody always says dungeons, like I want dungeons. But for me, like, that's kind of like a minimal thing. I thought the shrine implementation of these little bite-sized things that to me again, were kind of reminiscent of Skyrim, right? Like there's these little mini dungeons. They just kind of go in, you do your thing, you're done. It's like a bite-sized little mini adventure, which is really cool. It lends itself to the fact that the Switch is technically a portable console. I think that's kind of a cool idea. But what was missing for me was really just a kind of like an impactful and better integrated storyline. Um, the entire game itself, uh, Breath of the Wild, that is, the story is presented in a very different way. Um, there are some cutscenes, there are some cinematics as you go forward, uh, but they're very few and far between. And the majority of the story is meant to be taken in um, with how you see the lore throughout the game. Like there's lots of diaries that you can read, things like that. You kind of have to discover it on its own, which is cool. Um, Outside of that, you can also find little memories which give you more insight as to exactly what did happen 100 years ago uh, before this calamity uh, destroyed all of Hyrule. Um, and that's a really cool concept. It's very unique, it's very artistic. But the one thing that stuck out to me was like, I didn't really feel propelled to go forward. Um, and not to transition into a different game topic, but the one thing that was really refreshing back in 2017 was when Xenoblade Chronicles 2 came out because I went from Breath of the Wild to Xenoblade, uh, which were both developed by Monolith Soft. If you didn't know, um, the open world of Breath of the Wild was not created by the Zelda team at all, really. Uh, Monolith Soft, the uh, JRPG legendary uh, developing team, they created that open world alongside of uh, alongside the Zelda team, but they, they were the ones that actually designed the world and made it what it is um, for Breath of the Wild. Um, so it was kind of like very similar when I played Xenoblade, aside from the fact that I felt a need to go forward. Like there was a very present storyline and uh, driving uh, emotional aspect to the game where it was like, there was constantly like, what happens next? Like, I wanna see this, like, whoa, like that almost made me cry, right? Like, and I didn't feel that at all with Breath of the Wild other than like two or three cutscenes towards the end, um, which took 300 hours to get to for me. Um, and that's fine, but in Breath of the Wild 2, I would love to see some of that implemented. You know, now we have the foundation of all these different characters. You know, we have the guardians, uh, uh, champions, uh, sorry. But we have the champions, we're aware of their backstory. Um, obviously they're ghosts, um, but you know, we can, I, I can see how they can implement maybe some of their family members or just some of the tribes that we've already come in contact with and familiarized <clears throat> ourselves with, you know. Uh, there's a lot to build off of there. 
Also just the, the character foundations and background of the current Link and Zelda, like they're kind of already there. We don't need to go into the backstory of Zelda's traumatic childhood, right? Like now is a perfect time to kind of have like a, like a really strong heroine Zelda, kind of similar to the Twilight Princess Zelda we saw, right? Like where she's just a badass, you know, that would be really cool seeing some of that. Um, also this Link has established himself as being also a badass, you know? Um, another thing that was different in Breath of the Wild was it wasn't like a coming of age story. Uh, if you really go back and look at the lore, uh, which again is presented in just like little diaries that you really have to find and read, the Link in Breath of the Wild was actually like a knight. Like he was a legit knight, he was appointed by the king, um, then was kind of, I, I believe he was almost encouraged to try to get the Master Sword and he uh, was able to because he was the chosen hero. But there was no real like doubt in that. Like from a very young age, this Link was a badass. Like he, you know, he never talked. He just kind of did things. Uh, he was, you know, everyone that came across him, even as a young child, immediately knew like this kid was it. Uh, which is a cool, like different take on his character. Uh, but now that Link has been established, right? So we know this Link is a super badass that has literally died and come back um, and saved the world. So where do you go from there? Uh, to go back to the last real, like, in my opinion, successful sequel to a Zelda game, we get back to Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. And what did they do with that? They completely stripped him of everything. Um, and that was a very strange way to change the story, but it felt very impactful because that Link had already been established. Like when those strange things started happening to the young Ocarina of Time Link, you were immediately like, what the heck, dude? Because you were familiar with that character and everything he had already gone through. It's kind of the same thing with Breath of the Wild Link, where it's like, you you know their backstories. So what are they gonna throw? What kind of curveballs are they gonna throw? Um, I would love to see, I would love to see uh, some way for Link to kind of have to go back uh, mentally into what happened 100 years prior. Uh, and if we look at some of the things that we have seen in terms of like the little snippets of cutscenes and gameplay that Nintendo has showed, like there's clearly two different somethings, right? Like there's one version of Link that has like long hair and he's all tattered up. Uh, and then there's a version of Link that is looking kind of like we remember him from Breath of the Wild. So there's a lot of theories and I don't wanna get, I hate getting the theories and stuff, but that there's almost like a dark and a light world you know, like there was in A Link to the Past, or there's like a future and past, kind of like there was in Ocarina of Time. I would love to see that be like Link going back to uh, the the Zelda or the Hyrule of a hundred years prior uh, to the Calamity. Uh, that would be really cool to explore that, you know, when things were kind of bumbling and actually happening. Um, but even if they don't do that, I would love to see instead them kind of take the, the route of going like the cataclysmic, like, this is it. Like we saw like calamity, like post calamity Hyrule, right? So now things we can assume maybe have started to rebuild themselves. Um, there's clearly gonna be some kind of new evil entity that's gonna present itself to Link and Zelda. Um, and that little tiny cinematic, the original one back in like 2019 showed them going down into a crypt. And I believe it was like a dead Ganon, which like started shaking and stuff. Like there was a lot of game theories behind that um, that I won't, bother with but so we know that happened and we know that the master sword is all messed up uh, that's the other thing that's shown us it's just like a weird kind of warped master sword so something super serious happened um, link also has these kind of weird tattoo looking things on his arm so something serious happened to link i would love to see that be like an end all just cataclysmic like dark kind of thing like real like emotional gripping story where you're like whoa like just really kind of inspires that feeling of need uh, you know I, the one thing that was great about the older Zelda games is it oh, they always had that if you go back to the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for example like it almost had that transition halfway through where young Link has this like yeah like there's Ganon like there's clearly evil there's like bad guys and stuff but for the most part Kid Link's entire Hyrule um, from the Ocarina of Time is like, it's a chill place to be. Like Hyrule is is, is fine. Um, then when he wakes up from his seven year slumber um, after pulling out the Master Sword and goes into the future where Ganon has destroyed everything, you are immediately shocked. Um, you go into a temple to pull out that sword. When you go into the temple, the entire, 
the entire town is is bumbling. Uh, there's there's just like music playing. There's people dancing. There's kids with dogs and stuff. You pull that sword out. You go into a seven year coma. You wake up with the sage telling you that you know you had to your body had to evolve to match the strength of the sword. It's a whole thing. Uh, you know that's a whole different topic. Uh, really cool lore, but. You walk out of that building, right? First of all, you look down at yourself and you're an adult. So there's like kind of like that character progression of like, whoa, that's pretty neat. But you walk out of that building, those same people are now all zombies and they will literally kill you. Like that's crazy. Like that, the, the transition of light to dark there is gnarly. Uh, then when you go into the sequel of the game, uh, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, like it gets even crazier. Like the entire, the entire game of uh, Majora's Mask is like based around people that are all afraid to die. Like the moon is falling and the entire world is about to end. There is a character from the prior game that has gone insane and is trying to destroy the world by means of like ancient rituals. Like it is intense. And that feeling of just like, whoa, like we need to fix this. Like that's the kind of sense of urgency I want in Breath of the Wild 2. Because in, or <laughs> in Tears of the Kingdom, I'm so used to saying that. Because in, uh, in Breath of the Wild, like, yeah, there was a hundred years ago, there was a calamity. Ganon obviously destroyed the entire planet. But now he's just kind of contained in this castle, and there's a whole world to explore. And for me at least, like, and I feel like everyone that played that game, it's like, there was no sense of urgency to go and help Zelda. Like, I almost felt bad after playing that game for 300 hours, and just like literally, like, lifting up rocks and looking for Koroks, because I'm just like, eh, it's fine. It's been that's been happening for a hundred years like what's another six months gonna do um, and that's you know it's funny it's very funny and uh, it definitely like helped the progress and the way that you can explore that game carefree but like I would love to see like breath there <laughs> I would love to see tears of the kingdom just kind of have this this storyline set up to where like you feel propelled to save everything and yeah I would like to see the inclusion of like actual dungeons I would also like to see probably just as much as all those things some real music like the you know and it really made sense for like the post-apocalyptic feel in breath of the wild to just have that like little bit of piano here and there um it was almost like bits and pieces of uh, an actual soundtrack that got like chopped up that's what it felt like like it feels like an organic experience in the sense where like it's clearly just it's almost like a it's almost like you took a book and you let it get bleached in the sun and then try to read it. Like, that's what it sounds like. That's a weird analogy, but that's what the soundtrack for Breath of the Wild was for me. And so you go into like the shrines where you get like a little bit of cool music, but it's, it's very few and far between. Um, I would love for like there to be a legit, like orchestrated Zelda soundtrack, like we saw in the older games. Um, those things to me, I think would be just, they would make for the best, like possibly the best Zelda game of all time, right? Because now we're working with this amazing tried and true uh engine and, and world of like how you explore um just in terms of like the control scheme and everything like the way that you explore breath of the wild is is unmatched like to this day like just the way that you can go from like standing on a mountain to jumping uh gliding across the thing uh gliding, gliding across the map to jumping off of that glider uh you know surfboarding or surfing on your shield down a mountain and then fighting an enemy that you didn't know was there. Like that amount of just like one thing to the next, like such organic exploration, like that's unmatched. I don't know if any other game will ever get to that point. Um, but if you can combine that with a real soundtrack and a real emotional gripping storyline um, and maybe some dungeons, you know, that would be the best Zelda game of all time. Um, and that's something to be excited for. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> what would you guys like to see in the next Zelda game? And is there anything that I stuck out to you that, you know, you would like to see instead? Um, and I guess I would, you know, now that I'm kind of wrapping this rant up a little bit, I would like to leave you with one thing, um, just as far as like artwork goes. So The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, you know, had some of the coolest artwork, concept art, like in all of gaming ever. Right, like, and that's that was like the level of epicness, and this is supposed to be portrayed. This is like, to me, this is a very emotional portrayal of like what Link comes out of the temple and kind of sees. Is like these is like a, an accurate representation of like, you know, 
uh, kind of encapsulates the future in Ocarina of Time. Um, and here is, spoiler alert for Majora's Mask, but uh, here is the end of what Link becomes in Majora's Mask. Like, just look at this creepy epicness, you know? Let's get back to that point. <laughs> like, please, Nintendo. Uh, we have everything, we have all the pieces in place. Link has these weird tattoos on his arm, the Master Sword's all messed up. Let's see Breath of the Wild Link go Super Saiyan, or Fierce Deity, if you will. Like, that's, what, that's the kind of ending that, you know, would just drive it over the edge. Um, but yeah, anything that you guys, what do you guys think the, would make the ultimate Zelda game? Or what are you guys hoping or expecting to see in this next Zelda title? Um, you know, uh, to transition for some final thoughts, like what did you guys think of that Nintendo Direct? That for me was a little disappointing, but we also got a couple cool things. Like, what are, you, are you guys Pikmin fans? Like, are you excited for Pikmin 4? Um, I know that this is completely uh, sidestepping the Legend of Zelda series, but that is pretty crazy that we got nothing that we were hoping for but everything that we were doubting. Uh, Pikmin 4, that's a thing. That's, that's pretty crazy, right? Um, so anyway, um, if you're still here, uh, super congratulations, and I appreciate you immensely. Uh, this is probably the longest video that I'll ever do, and uh, the reason for that is just, again, like this series is so near and dear to me, and uh, I cannot express enough how freaking excited I am that we're finally getting a sequel. Uh, and this game is going to be relevant again. Um, so yeah, guys, if, if you enjoyed this video, if you would like to see more, uh, feel free, again, like, subscribe. Uh, drop some comments about, like, what you want to see in this game. Um, or just, like, what you feel like is your favorite Zelda memory, you know? Be curious to hear some of that. All right, guys, thank you for hearing me. Have an awesome night.